first off, I'm really sorry about how the quality of the video is going to turn out. This is basically just going to be still images over background because I had an incredibly hard final week. This semester is finally over, and though I have to do a mandated summer semester too, at least it's going to not start as bad as the end of this one is. And just honestly, I didn't have enough time this week to edit this video to the normal level of quality. I'm starting to record this at 11.38 p.m. on Saturday night, and not only would I like to have this done and uploaded at least a couple hours early for patrons, but I'd also really need to have it done so it will be out on Sunday at all, and I have to go home on Sunday. So a lot of that day is taken up, so I'm sorry about that. But on brighter news, my Patreon has done incredibly well. Thank all of you yet again. We've hit not only the Xeno Gears goal, but also the Xeno Saga goal. And during the two weeks that I have where I can be home, I'm going to order all the equipment and make sure everything works. And then by the end of May, I will be able to start playing and recording Xeno Gears for videos on this channel. Also, I figured, hey, a lot of you are Xenoblade fans, and more specifically, Xenoblade 2 fans, aka very new to the series, and probably have heard the names of other Xeno games before even Xenoblade 1, and that was... 2012 in North America, so that's a bunch of years ago even then. So, I figured, now that I'm about to get into those games, I'll just explain the series as a whole. It's also worth mentioning that I will be going by Japanese release dates, unless otherwise specified, just because that made it a little quicker to script this, in all honesty. I had to make a lot of concessions here, and I'm sorry again. So, what is the Xeno series? To put it most simply, it's one man's giant, decade-spanning, universe-spanning, crossover fanfiction of 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Bible, and some psychologists. That is a joke, but it is surprisingly true. Although, a better way to explain it would be, Xeno is a prefix given to RPGs of a similar ilk that has spanned several different companies, several different publishers, several different consoles, three decades, and two millennia. They all have a lot of things connected to each other, and them being developed by a lot of the same staff and having the same name isn't the only reason people like to draw connections between them. And they are all, up until very recently, cult classics that never really got the mainstream attention their quality deserved. So I'm just gonna go through the history of the series, sort of explain how we got to where we are now, and, yeah, this is going to be a roadmap that I'm going to follow in the future as I start playing some of the older games for myself. So, starting out with Xenogears. It started life as a script written by the husband and wife duo of Tetsuya Takahashi and Kaori Tanaka, who goes by the name Soraya Saga in most cases, as a proposed script for Final Fantasy VII. These two were working at Squaresoft at the time, and I believe they both did art-related stuff, so they weren't really writers, and they weren't programmers or anything. But this proposal was actually rejected for being too dark and too complex for Final Fantasy, which is weird because that means Square actually used to have standards about Final Fantasy games, which is really weird talking about that from the year 2019, although their standards included denying Xenogears the Final Fantasy title, so even then they weren't too great. This script was inspired by their mutual interests in psychology and kickstarted a bunch of themes that will be seen going forwards in the other games. While the proposal was rejected from being a Final Fantasy game, they were allowed to pursue development of the title independently. There were also originally plans to make it a Chrono game, but that fell through as well. Although it did rely on the same composer that Chrono Trigger used, that being Yasunori Mitsuda. Xenogears released in the year 1998 for the PS1. This was sandwiched right in between Final Fantasies 7 VII and 8. It reviewed pretty well, but didn't sell too great, though it did, of course, get a cult following. One of the main criticisms of the game was that its second disc was extremely rushed when compared to pretty much any other JRPG of its type. And it's actually mostly cutscenes following a certain point in the story, which is where you change discs. This turned out to not be because of programming errors or difficulties or that kind of thing, but because the game was too ambitious for its own good. The team just 
couldn't get everything they wanted to get done done in the time frame they had, and as such, it was released in that state. A bit later on, a book called Perfect Works was announced. This was an art book and a lore book expanding on a bunch of things that were only hinted at in Xenogears proper. This and the ending of the game revealed that Xenogears is only part five of a six-part series. And things in Perfect Works explain where the other parts of the series would have taken place in the timeline relative to Xenogears itself and, of course, if those games were ever made. Because, of course, it didn't do very well and the next Gears game they had in the works was scrapped, it was axed, they couldn't get funding, and probably even worse than that, the IP was not treated very well by Square until rather recently, which I'm assuming is them trying to ride off of the Xenoblade hype because... Only in the past few years, Xenogears characters have started showing up in spin-off Final Fantasy games. World of Final Fantasy got Xenogears as a boss, I believe. Brave Exvius, a gacha game, actually got, like, five party members as playable characters. And Xenogears itself was ported to PS3, PSP, and PS Vita via the PS1 Classics Collection. Which is nice... But it's actually still more economic for me to just buy a PS2 and play all of the games on that when I'm doing this. So that's why I'm doing that. A PS2 and four games is cheaper than a PS3 and one game and a PS2 and three games. Of course, with a series with that much potential behind it, fans want more. Like a remastered port, a full-on remake, even a sequel, which probably wouldn't have the original team's blessing, but whatever. Although, this is Square Enix we're talking about. Xenogears, while it's been popping up a bit more recently and is sort of being seen as a now actual cousin to the Final Fantasy series, like it was originally intended to be an actual member of, they're probably not going to do anything with this. It's, it's Square. They're not even very good at making JRPGs anymore for the most part, so would you really even want that from this version of the company? I probably wouldn't. But I digress because it's time to start talking about Xeno Saga. As I mentioned, another Gears game was in the works, but that got axed, and Takahashi, as well as a few other people, were fed up with Square's way of running things, basically only focusing on their major IPs, and wow, that is still totally a problem Square Enix has. It's almost like they don't learn from things. But a large amount of Gears' staff members left with Takahashi to form the studio Monolith Soft, which sought around for publishers to work under because they didn't think they could make it independently, and eventually became a subsidiary of Namco. They began work on a new series to tell other parts of the perfect work story, but, of course, the Xenogears IP remained with Square, so they couldn't use that. Hence, them now making the title of Xeno Saga. This was also planned to be a six-part incredibly ambitious series, and is a bit more space opera-y than... Gears, which honestly feels a lot more like a Blade game than Saga did, just based off of what I know. I don't want to delve too deeply into the games because while I know a lot of plot things that happen already, I don't want to completely spoil myself on all these things. After episode 1 of Xeno Saga was released in 2002 for the PS2, Takahashi stepped back a bit and tried to let younger teams handle the development. These people decided to change the direction of the franchise quite a bit, take fan feedback into account for episode 2, and turn Xeno Saga into a multimedia franchise. That's why there are manga and anime for Xeno Saga episode 1, a few other pieces of merch, and the spin-off Xeno Saga Freaks, which was also released for PS2, and I will not be playing because that's just another rare expensive game that I would need to purchase, and since I'm using Patreon money for that, I don't really want to tax you guys too hard. Episode 2 released in 2004, again for the PS2, and it wasn't particularly well received. It was lauded as making a lot of changes people didn't like and taking the series in a direction that a lot of fans took umbrage with. Around the same time, the other spin-off, Xenosaga Pied Piper, which was a episodic three-part mobile spin-off, which I will also not be covering because this was for Japanese Vodafone in like 2004, which there's no way you can get that I don't know, I don't even know where to start playing that. But after that, Soraya Saga left the series. And the whole Xeno Saga epic was retooled to end at episode 3, ending the story of the current main character, Shion Izuki, but still leaving the end a little bit open for future games 
would people desire that? Takahashi took a much more leading role again in the development of Episode 3, which released for PS2 in 2006. In the same year, Japan also got Xenosaga 1 Plus 2, which is a remake port thing of the first two Xenosaga games for the DS. 2 was retooled a lot to be more under Takahashi's vision. Which, you know, it didn't even get a worldwide release, so that didn't really help seeing the quote-unquote definitive version of Episode 2, and I will not be covering that game because while I think it does have a translation, I figured it would be kind of weird to have 2 be 2 from 1 and 2, but 1 be the PS1 1 and then 2 1 and it, it's just too complicated to do it that way. So I'm just going to stick with the original PS2 releases because that was what we originally got and that was what my region of the world got at all. Modern day Bandai Namco is a lot nicer to Xenosaga than Square Enix ever was to Xenogears. While the games have never seen remasters, re-releases, or anything like that, despite tons of fan demand, and, like, people also want sequels because it's also an open-ended ending to the series, but Xenosaga does still get new merch frequently. Xenogears did get a few new figures very recently, but Saga's been kind of getting stuff on, on and off for ever since the series ended. And Cosmos is actually considered somewhat of a mascot for Bandai Namco. Xenosaga is treated with respect as one of their legacy franchises that just happens to have run its course and be finished, but Cosmos has appeared in plenty of crossovers. Namco Cross Capcom and the Project Cross Zone series, which was developed for the 3DS by the now Nintendo-owned Monolith Soft many years after the end of Xenosaga. And Cosmos even got to cross over with a certain spoiler character from Xenoblade 1 in Project Cross Zone 2, which brought that character, as well as Krom and Lucina, into the mix, uniting Bandai Namco, Capcom, Sega, and Nintendo under one incredible crossover that's, like, legitimately almost as cool as Smash Ultimate. Cosmos even still gets representation in other Namco games. And, in fact, while this is a remake of a game from several years ago, the most recent instance of this would be a costume of her in Tales of Vesperia, which recently got ported to the Switch. And the Namco-Nintendo monolith relationship is still good enough that Cosmos and Telos were even allowed to cameo in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, in a potentially canon role too, question mark. And so, we get to Xenoblade. Throughout this entire time, ever since Monolith Soft was founded, they'd worked on plenty of not-Xeno games, including the Bait and Kaito series, which was for GameCube, and was basically the Monolith Soft JRPG if you owned a Nintendo system, not a Sony one. Over time, though, the relationship with Namco was souring, and in 2007, Nintendo bought a majority share in the company. So, Monolith's non-licensed games, so they developed, like, a Super Robot Wars game and a DBZ game for DS and stuff. Actually, I think ever since they were bought out, they've only developed Nintendo system games, but... All of the Monolith developed, not licensed games, would be exclusively for Nintendo systems and would be published by Nintendo themselves. So this was cool, and they are taking advantage of it with things like Soma Bringer, which was written by Saga, and Disaster Day of Crisis, but Takahashi's big RPG team was suffering low morale after Xenogears not panning out, and then Xenosaga also kind of failing at Part 3. It got a cult classic reception, but kind of no better than Xenogears did. But in June 2006, Takahashi was struck with a wonderful, wonderful idea. People living on the dead bodies of giant gods. He told this to some of his team members, and they quickly put a model together and decided to put that with a story that they'd already kind of had kicking around. And as such, they decided to revolutionize the JRPG genre by taking everything they learned, combining the best aspects of the classic JRPGs of yesteryear that a lot of the staff members had worked on, as well as tons of new modern sensibilities and even a Western-inspired touch. And this game was going to be called Monado, Beginning of the World. And this is the title it was shown under at E3 2009. In between that and its 2010 release in Japan, it got a name change to Xenoblade. The Chronicles was actually added by the Nintendo of Europe localization team, and it was just kind of picked up by all the other localizations, including the Nintendo America one, which was literally just stealing the European one after Operation Rainfall. 
somewhat convinced them to actually bring the game stateside, even though it got a god-awful release and didn't really see the sales it deserved until it was re-released on the 3DS and Wii U. But I'm totally sidetracking myself because in between that E3 showing and the final release, Satoru Iwata himself, showing once again just how much of a legend he was in life, suggested a name change for the game to Xenoblade in order to honor not only the work Takahashi and his team was putting in to Blade, but also the legacy of Xenogears and Xenosaga. And as such, the Xeno prefix with the blessing of the guy who was in charge of the company that was publishing the game, Xeno now became the prefix for a Tetsuya Takahashi, a Monolith Soft JRPG in the same vein as their original work. Xenoblade Chronicles was received incredibly well by critics and adored by the majority of fans and was now picking up even more people who had never played a Xeno game before because they'd never owned a Sony console before. It was on the Wii. Everyone had a Wii, including probably a lot of people who had just gotten off of Xeno Saga and hey, there you go, it's another Xeno game. A few people were put off by its drastic gameplay change and a bit less of the psychology and overt religious stuff, but a lot of people just say they like the entire Xeno series, and that's how I think you should be. I'm that way with Bleed, and I hope to be like that with all of the games. And so, Xeno slowly but surely began to get the recognition it deserved, starting with Shulk being included in Super Smash Bros. for 3DS and Wii U. Then, Xenoblade Chronicles getting ported to the new Nintendo 3DS. And then, Xenoblade Chronicles X, known as Xenoblade Cross in Japan, which explicitly defined it not as part of the Xenoblade Chronicles series, it was Xenoblade, gameplay, cross, other players, cross, ideas from Gears and Saga that weren't in Blade 1. The argument that X being different automatically makes it bad because it's got Xenoblade in the name, so it should be exactly like the other Xenoblade game, which means it's poopy garbage, is a flawed argument because it was never supposed to be the same series. It is Xenoblade cross other things, not just Xenoblade. But anyway, I kind of just made a video about X, so I don't really need to explain more there. But of course, they kept developing, they kept working with Nintendo on some of their games, and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 released in 2017. This marked a bunch of cool things. The first worldwide release for a Xeno game. The first Blade game that really had a chance to shine because the Switch was doing so much better than the Wii U. It released year one for the Switch. It was one of Nintendo's holiday titles for that year, standing up with the likes of Super Mario Actual Odyssey. And it got prominent DLC. The expansion pass is great. Torn of the Golden Country is great when it released also worldwide in 2018. And it is now the best-selling Xeno game to date. It brought plenty of old ideas that weren't in Xenoblade Chronicles 1 from the older games. It's very Xenogears in a lot of parts. And it even brought in possible links between every game with a Xeno prefix into the fold, possibly, nominally at least, because IPs are a bitch, connecting all the games together for the first time. And then we move to the future. Xenoblade is more popular than ever. Monolith is now expanding. It's got like five teams now. It's recruiting even more new graduates to try and bring new blood into the company. It has a team dedicated to work on the Zelda series, a team dedicated to help Nintendo out on their projects. It's possibly working on a new IP. And of course, it's looking to continue Xenoblade and keep the legacy alive. They're also taking steps to further define the series. Several members of the team have talked about wanting to make a Xenoblade 3 or Xenoblade X2. In their most recent Xenoblade hiring push, they're trying to find a new artist to give the series a distinct style, like Tetsuya Nomura has for Final Fantasy. The future for Xeno has never looked brighter, and I'm eager to see where it goes next, while looking into the past at the same time. And also, another cool thing about Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Takahashi finally got to work with Tetsuya Nomura, which is something he's been wanting to do since his days at Square. Of course, if Gears was a Final Fantasy game, Nomura would have done the character designs for it. That never happened, but hey, he finally got to design a few peeps for Xenoblade 2, so things are finally coming full circle. Also, Kingdom Hearts 3 might basically be a Xeno game, but that's besides the point, because we're done with this video. Thank you so much for watching, as always. I'm sorry this video is kinda bad, but 
it was the best I could do, and I really didn't want to keep you guys waiting for this long. With that being said, though, I would like to sleep, but first, I would like to thank my patrons very much, including Satsuri Okoi, Dead Pat, Lily Starflame, and Jenkles, as well as Barrix, who was the first person who gave enough money for the creator shoutout tier to actually ask me to do a shoutout, and it totally wasn't what I had in mind when I said I'll shout out your content, but fanfiction.net, that is totally a type of content you could do, so yeah, by all means, go check out Barracks' fanfiction.net page. There's a link for that in the description. It's got a lot of Destiny Feet Stay Night stuff, I believe, which isn't anything I would know about, but if that's the kind of thing you like, then totally go check it out. Until next time, when hopefully I will have time to make a much better quality video, it will be revisiting the Flesh Eater video that I made well before Torna was even out, and actually doing it correctly now that we have Torna info. So yeah, until next time, this is Luxon, signing off.